Hi there. Uh, welcome to day two of SBI2 High Content 2020 virtual meeting. Um, my name is Paul Johnston. I'm uh, an associate professor of pharmaceutical sciences in the School of Pharmacy uh, at the University of Pittsburgh. Originally, we had planned to have this uh, meeting live and in person in Pittsburgh, but the uh, COVID-19 pandemic changed all that. And in March, the SBI2 uh, Board of Directors decided to hold its annual uh, conference and exhibit hall virtually. Um, so as you can imagine, uh, starting in March, they had to identify a, a commercial partner um, to host the meeting. And um, after a lot of deliberation, uh, headed up by ne Debbie Nickersher and other members of the board of directors, they decided to partner with LabRoots uh, to put on the meeting. Consistent with um, our educational mission, SBI2 board of directors decided to make uh, registration and participation in the meeting uh, free. Um, I would encourage you um, to visit the website because we have a number of, um, you know, SBI2 is a volunteer organization. And there are a number of open positions um, on the board. If you'd like to volunteer, uh, please go to the website and look into that. You can, uh, there are all sorts of levels that you can participate at. If you don't wanna be on the board of directors, you can certainly be on a, a variety of committees that have different uh, charters. Uh, just a reminder that there is a poster session that you can visit and, um, the poster awards will be announced later today. Um, on behalf of the Scientific Program Committee, which is myself, uh, Joe Trask, and Beth Simony, uh, I would like to thank the uh, keynote speakers, the session chairs, and the uh, speakers for each of the sessions uh, for pivoting uh, with us and uh, agreeing to participate in the virtual meeting. Um, I'd also like to uh, call out um, Judy Wardwell and Santosh, uh, the marketing group that recruited uh, our sponsors. We have platinum sponsors, Molecular Devices and Perkin Elmer, and gold sponsors, Luminex, Millipore Sigma, and Thermo Fisher. In addition, I would like to encourage you to go to the exhibitor hall and uh, visit the other uh, exhibitors. In, um, in addition to our Meeting sponsors, there will be uh, exhibitors like Chromo, uh, Olympus, and Core Life Analytics. Okay, without any further ado, uh, I would like to um, introduce our keynote speaker for today. Um, his name is Scott Fraser. Um, he's the Provost Professor of Biological Sciences, Biomedical Engineering, Physiology and Biophysics, Pediatrics, Radiology, Stem Cell Biology, Regenerative Medicine and Ophthalmology at the University of Southern California in LA. Um, he is the Director of Science Initiatives. Um, he's the Elizabeth, Elizabeth Garrett Chair in Convergent Biosciences and Co-Director of the USC Bridge Institute. Um, Scott has more than 240 uh, peer-reviewed publications he has a long-standing commitment to quantitative biology, applying the tools of chemistry, engineering, and physics to problems of biology and medicine. Um, his personal research centers on imaging and molecular analysis of intact biological systems, early development as, with an emphasis on early development, organogenesis, and uh, medical diagnostics. Um, his title is um, Adding Dimensions to Intravital Imaging, and he's going to um, talk to us about a variety of different imaging techniques and how those can um, be applied to investigate uh, complex biologies. And with that, I'll hand it over to you, Scott. Welcome, and uh, uh, I look forward to your, your presentation.
Well, thank you very much for having me with you today. I'm very excited to tell you about the work we've been doing trying to bring intravital imaging and multiplex imaging to problems in biomedical research. The work I'm going to tell you about today was made possible by some very forward-looking foundations and programs within the federal granting uh, bodies. And it's also uh, resulted in some translational efforts, both some patents that have been licensed through Caltech USC and the Alfred Mann Institute, and then some corporate relationships that are in the midst of commercializing some of the efforts that I'll tell you about today. The work I'm going to tell you about today really draws on a basic question, which is how do we engineer a group of cells to make pattern? And we think that systems biology is ideally suited for asking these questions within the confines of an embryo. So embryos have the huge advantage of being programmed in the development that they undergo. They're small enough and fast enough to be appropriate for imaging approaches, and they have reproducible developmental events. Many of the analyses that have been performed recently have involved sort of single cell omics analyses or proteomics analyses. And most of these involve taking the cells out of their normal context. And while this has shown tremendous amounts about the different cell types and their programming, it sacrifices a lot of the intrinsic information about relationships between cells. What we want to do is to come up with a set of embodied cell systems analyses, that is taking the cell and analyzing it within its normal context. We wanna be able to use the dynamics and use the variance as the signal itself that we wanna study by looking at the way cells change over time or their covariance in gene expression, we should be able to help re better reverse engineer the underlying gene regulatory networks and developmental events that are taking place. Of course, this takes tools that are beyond those that we typically use. It requires tools that are intrinsically multimodal and multiplex, and I want to share some of those with you today. What I'm going to do today is try to draw on a few different stories within the lab that range from some multiplex imaging approaches uh, using HCR and MUSE, some ways of trying to extract more information from these images using hyperspectral approaches, and some imaging approaches using light sheet and light field microscopy. And I hope I can make these all come together for you. Now, the main thing I wanna to try to emphasize is that biological imaging is intrinsically always a compromise. There really is no free lunch we're always going to have to sacrifice speed to get greater resolution or to expose ourselves to more photo damage if we try to image more quickly or at higher resolution because of the increased light load. Well, there's no free lunch. What, what, what I'm going to try to show you today is that there's a few ways to make the lunch tab as inexpensive as possible and to really make cells uh, studyable that we once thought we really couldn't get a grasp on. I want to start by a very basic uh, biological question, which is where do genes uh, express? Where are the RNAs expressed? And in situ hybridization is a technique most of us have employed and most of us uh, both love and hate. The normal way of doing in situ hybridization involves using an antisense probe. And in some cases, it's possible to use an antisense probe directly labeled with a dye. But in most cases, to get enough signal to be above the background of the tissue, one has to use an antisense probe that's conjugated to some sort of gain mechanism. And the typical gain mechanism is an enzyme. That enzyme deposits some sort of uh, chromogen or fluoric, fluoric, fluorochrome within the tissue. And the beauty of this is that it gives us gain the problem with this is that while it's very good about showing us where things are expressed, for example, these panels in the middle of the, uh, of the screen showing you where some uh, genes that are involved in segmenting the embryo show up, it's not as quantitative 
as the technologies that are typically used for doing single cell omics. So as a result, it's possible, as shown in the right hand side of your screen, to have uh, two renderings of the same gene at the same stage in the same strain of mouse look dramatically different. And so what we really need is something that's far more quantitative and reproducible. And so what we've been trying to work on is ways of getting programmable molecular gain. The technique we've been exploiting has been using uh, collaboration with Niles Pierce and his colleagues based on hybridization chain reaction to start with. This hybridization chain reaction relies on hairpins that are quite happy complex with each other, even though they might have a few more base pairings if they uh, opened up and reacted with one another. They'll stay stable, metastable in that state until they see an initiator sequence that's shown as I1. And you can notice that I1 has a sequence A star that's complementary to the A of the toehold of the left-hand hairpin. So when it binds there, it's possible for it to bind and then uh, base pair along the, uh, the stem of the hairpin and substitute its base pairing for that of the other half of the base pair of the, of the uh, hairpin so that uh, the hairpin will open. When it opens, it now has a slightly more base pairing than it had before because of the, the added bit of the toehold. And when it opens up, you can see that C star B star is revealed, which happens to be the initiator sequence of the other hairpin. And so what happens is that this continues to grow and it grows explosively to about a 200 mer. And since I've shown a dye molecule here just as a star, this gives us a way to get a programmable gain. Wherever there's an initiator, we get a gain of about 200 dye molecules spaced out over this amplicon. If we run this in a gel, you can see that the gel runs from large molecular weight things up at the top to small molecular weight things at the bottom. If we run the hairpins in the gel, the left-hand lane shows you that they run as a mixture of hairpins. In this case, I have four different dyes on four different hairpin pairs. Because of the sequence specificity of the uh, hairpin opening, if I add initiator one, you can see that I get an amplification, an increase in size in uh, the lane my, uh, marked I1. If I add initiator two, I get a similar gain, but now it's red because I've amplified the red dyed hairpins. This gives us a way of orthogonally labeling a number of different uh, species based on the initiator that they bear. To make it into an NC2 hybridization technique, what we do is use antisense probes that have initiators hanging off of them. You can see that cartooned here. And when the hairpins are added, wherever one of the cognizant hairpin initiators are, the hairpins will amplify and we'll get enough signal to see. Now, since the active species are hairpins and the hairpins don't interact with much else, they can penetrate into tissue very nicely. And so we get very reliable amplification we get good depth penetration, and we get very good dynamic range out of this. So instead of it saturating the way that chromophores can when we use enzymes, this gives us a nice linear gain. As a result, when Vikas Trivedi, one of our colleagues, did tests of the linearity, you can see two key things in this plot of red versus green recognizing the same RNA within an intact zebrafish embryo. One is that the slope is one. That's very encouraging because it means they're both reporting the same amount. You can see it's a pretty good R value. And you can see that the signal is clearly greater than zero. So it means that we've got a good ability to see even low levels of expression, even in these low power situations. Now, biological imaging, as I mentioned, is always a compromise. 
one of the things I didn't mention earlier is the photon budget. And we're always going to be limited by how quickly we can image based on how many dye molecules are there. And so one of the things we've been working on recently is making improved versions that of HCR that might give us better uh, amplification. The one that we've been most uh, happy with is MUSE, which is a slight reworking and, and extension from the original HCR. In MUSE, we've got the same idea of an initiator causing an amplification, but when it gives us that amplification, that amplification can be further amplified, again, linearly. And so what we end up with is a technique that we can put the initiator on an antibody or an antisense probe, and we can use it to see with fluorescence or use it, for example, inside of a cytoff using metal chelated polymers to see the uh, regionalization of the uh, label by using mass spec. The technology has been very reliable for letting us look at multiple antibodies by tagging them with the initiator. Here I'm showing you four different antibodies, all rapid antibodies, all directly labeled. And we're getting good recognition of even labels that are normally very hard to see without some sort of uh, rigorous chemical amplification of the signal. In this case, this, the amplification is very well behaved. We can do multiplex in C2. In this case, you can see five different RNAs in the middle. And we can mix the two since the gain is independent, or, or I'm sorry, it's chemically orthogonal, and the gain's uh, independent of the uh, of what bears the initiator. It's what the where the initiator is that gives us the signal. So you can see to the right using immunofluorescence and in situ hybridization together. So the good news is <clears throat> that these direct labeled molecular amplification techniques work. They give us good stable. Uh, gain. The gain is good and quantitative to just a few percent. And by multiplexing and doing a multiple rounds of it, Long Kai and others have been able to carry this up above 200 plex. So that's all good news. But one of the bad news is, is, is the amount of time it takes to image. So this was imaged with a confocal microscope. It's about 10 hours worth of imaging to collect the five or 10 gigavoxels of data. And you can see that we even had to tile the image a little bit. So this is four by six uh, image stacks. And so there's some regions that were double exposed and there's a slight bleaching at those places that were double exposed. So what we'd like is to have some way of getting away from this because of the long imaging time. And of course, it would be far, far worse if we want to see a whole embryo, a whole mouse embryo as shown here, uh, down to single message level, we'd have the problem of uh, trying to image at higher levels so we can see the individual dots rather than the ensemble average of the fluorescence as shown in the mouse image to the left. So the other issue is that what we'd really like to do is be able to multiplex quite a bit more than just a few dyes at a time. And so what I'm going to try to tell you about in the remainder of my time is the way that we've been extending both the imaging and the image processing so that we're able to solve both of these and turn them to our advantage. First, I'm going to start with the problem of overlapping spectra and trying to get more colors. So two conventional uh, fluorescent proteins that many of us use are the proteins of the GFP and YFP family. They're different colors to our eyes, but if you plot it in true color, you can see that this cartoon of the embryo and the real view of the embryo is quite a bit different because the spectra overlap so much. You can see that a typical um, uh, staining has an even greater problem because we're looking at multiple fluorescent proteins and multiple background sources of fluorescence intrinsic to the tissue or sometimes brought on by fixation or other things. Even if we used a very narrow uh, filter to let through only some bands of, of light, you can see that almost any place that we would position this, we would have multiple dyes coming through. 
So what we've been doing over the last decade or two is using different multispectral approaches to try to get around this problem. This is an approach that the remote sensing community, the people that build satellites and other um, technologies, have solved uh, many times over where they collect an a image and add a third dimension to it that is a spectral dimension. So it's an image cube where the third dimension is lambda. To be able to see that lambda, we've built a family of different microscopes, and some of them have been commercialized, as in the, the Zeiss family of confocal microscopes, by putting a diffractive element and then a spectrometer on as to collect to analyze the collected light. This shows you one of our early images. In this case, separating out two different green dyes, GFP and fluorescein. You can see the spectrum overlaps tremendously. You can see that the eight different spectral channels that are collected here um, have both dyes and all of them. But by using the basis spectra, these two spectra that I'm showing you in the bottom right, to separate the to, as the seed for a linear unmixing, you can see that it's possible to separate out the GFP, the green in this case, from the fluorescein, shown red in the pseudo color. The good news is it works. The bad news is that, that the noise of any linear unmixing sort of approach um, propagates from the noisiest channel to the less noisy channel. And in this image, if you look carefully, you'll see that underneath the green uh, nucleus, there's some increased noise in the cytoskeleton that the fluorescein phylloidin is seeing. So this is a problem that limits us because the noisiest and worst channel ends up dominating the performance. I was lucky that Francesco Cotrale and his colleagues um, had really come up with a way to get around this. And that's by moving to a different approach than linear and mixing, and that is moving to a phaser representation of the spectra. Here you can see that the red, green, and yellow, where they're both expressed, can be rendered in a spectral cube as a single green spectrum, a red spectrum, or the two humped yellow spectrum. If a Fourier transform is taken at that and we plot the sine and cosine term in this phasor plane, as Enrico Graton calls it, you can see that the red spectrum becomes a red dot, the green spectrum becomes a green dot, and a 50-50 mix of the two becomes a dot spaced halfway in between. This is very convenient because it turns something that would have been an inverse problem, computationally challenging and something where noise propagates into something that's much better behaved. So now we can easily use this forward behavior to uh, perform an analysis, for example, on our animal that's labeled with citrine and GFP. You can see here the linear unmixing gives us some good separation, but there's also a bleed through and that bleed through is largely the noise from one of the channels going to the other channel. The compressive approach of using the phaser unmixing is much better and much faster at cleanly separating out the signal of the two. If we look here at a rendering in 3D, I think you can get the feeling that we can carry this to quite a bit more colors. In this case, it was a uh, image that was collected on a multispectral confocal, a Zeiss 780 in this case. It's about 10 gigabytes worth of data the, because of the multispectral imaging. And you can see that uh, this sort of imaging, even though the spectra are very overlapped, gives us good separation between the multiple labels in just a minute or so instead of a couple hours as the normal linear unmixing requires. One of the problems we have with biological imaging is we want to image at minimal light dose. And as we go to lower and lower light dose as cartooned here, the spectrum starts being limited by the stochastics of how many photons are collected. 
So even though we know what the spectrum should be, once we go through the square root of n noise of the uh, photon counting, or the add in any uh, instrumental noise or other limitations, you can see the low signal to noise spectra. And what we've been trying to do is use machine learning approaches to reconstruct that spectrum. So using some good biophysical modeling to create both the ground truth and the noisy spectra, you can see here that the machine learning algorithm has been very good at reconstructing the real spectra out of spectra that are really quite uh, compromised by the low number of photon counts. This has allowed us now to start imaging things that are much more sensitive to light than we are typically able to image and gives us a much better image at the end. So you can see here using standard, standard linear unmixing or standard phaser uh, based linear unmixing. And then also uh, to the right is the hybrid unmixing with the machine learning. So it really does give us a much, much cleaner ability to go at low light levels. So as a result, we're able to see with good dynamic range at sensitive periods in live animals, multiple different signals, including autofluorescence and what's labeled here as background noise. Now, because this technique has good dynamic range, it means we can see the sources of autofluorescence and start to parse them apart into the retinoids, into the pre and bound NADH that informs us about the metabolic level of the cell, and also the xanthophores, one of the fluorescent cell types in the embryo that's autofluorescent. So this technique gives us the ability to see intrinsic signal as well as extrinsic signal. And we're really excited about using this now since it is an easy way to go after intrinsic signals in tissues that are not from transgenic animals. So if we think about this compromise again, you can see that the machine learning allows us to move to a much, much lower number of photons. And as a result, you can imagine that we could get a much faster image of a three-dimensional uh, specimen with more working resolution. We're still limited though, in that that was done with a confocal microscope that acquires the data one voxel at a time. And what I'm gonna tell you about now is that light sheet or SPIM microscopes, selective plane imaging microscopy, offers us the ability to go after this compromise with a little bit better speed and a little bit lower photo damage. I'm sure that most of the people here know about light sheet imaging in which Ernst Stilzer and his colleagues were able to uh, re re sort of reintroduce light sheet. It's a technique that's been uh, reinvented a few times over the last century. But the basic idea is to separate the excitation and the collection of the fluorescence by bringing the excitation light in from the side, for example, using the cylindrical lens as shown here, it was possible for the Stelzer lab to excite only a single plane and then to collect that in parallel and take advantage of the tremendous advances in cameras that has taken place over the last couple decades. We've been using our own version of this, which is to try to avoid the blue light, which can be scattered and instead using two photon excitation, an ultra fast infrared laser and those two photons that are at the same place at the same time can be absorbed and cause an excitation that, that the, for the dyes that seems similar to as if it was one blue photon that excited it, for example. But since it depends on two of them being absorbed at once, it ends up giving us an intensity squared sort of term. So if you look to the lower right, you can see uh, for a laser beam going across from left to right, you can see that if the blue light is excited, you can see an almost hourglass and you can see as the light is scattered, that hourglass gets thicker and thicker. With the infrared light, you can see as the light shines from left to right, there's no excitation because the light isn't concentrated enough. 
then we start to get excitation and these only the beads that are right in the middle of that concentrated bit of light uh, uh, end up being excited. So this allows us to image deeper in the tissue and with less concern about light scattering. And it has let us go after specimens that tend to be relatively light sensitive. Fly embryos are one of our favorite specimens because they're a bit more photosensitive than the other embryos that we use. So if we can get a good image of a fly embryo developing and hatching out of its shell, as you'll see this one does in just a moment, then we know that we've got a technique that can work on other systems. We've built systems that can go after this in a, a very demanding sort of setting. For example, imaging inside of the brain of a zebrafish embryo, an intact, or zebrafish larva, excuse me, an intact zebrafish larva while it's behaving. And we can see the individual, um, the individual cells here labeled with a calcium indicator as they um, reflect their excitation state by their cal intracellular calcium level. In this case, that was collected at about two volumes a second and there's uh, more than a thousand neurons that you could easily capture in this. And since the infrared light is invisible, it doesn't alter the behavior of the animal. So the two photon light sheet has been a tremendous help for us. It's let us image things down to cellular and subcellular resolution, like the beating heart that you're seeing here. And it takes the 10 hours of acquisition that I mentioned earlier and makes it just a couple minutes. So this allows us to go after advanced uh, problems in live animals, but also to do much more uh, rapid and detailed imaging of uh, fixed specimens. The cameras for doing, uh, doing light sheet imaging have gotten progressively better over the just the past few years. So we're really on a Moore's Law sort of trajectory now. And we're able to image things that we never thought would be possible. Now, as powerful as BIM is, or light sheet microscopy is, there's some situations when it's just not good enough. And this, this is one of them. And I showed you a reconstruction in the last uh, plane of a beating heart. Here's a reconstruction of individual planes. But now I'm going to show you a reconstruction of, um, of a three-dimensional uh, heart. In this case, you're seeing the three dimensions of the heart, not because we've captured the data at once, but because we can reassemble the 2D slices that were collected, separated by a few seconds in this case, and reassemble them into a rendering of what the heartbeat must have looked like in this beating zebrafish heart. Now, that means that we can get the muscles where the cells are reproducibly moving, but the blood cells that you're seeing in red are only sort of a glimmer of what the real blood cell trajectories would be. The blood cells that were imaged at one optical section at one time are not in the heart anymore when the next optical section is collected. So this rendering has an optical flow to it that we can see, but it's not something that's uh, really there. It's, a, it's an inference. One way to get around this would be to capture all three dimensions at once. And light field microscopy, a technology that's recently been uh, developed and refined, mostly uh, by the authors who you can see at the bottom of the screen in their references, um, has given us a way to do this. So you can see in this cartoon a camera and an objective lens. And as we go out of focus, we have a problem in that we don't really know which direction we went out of focus and we can't reconstruct in a conventional microscope uh, what the position of all the light emitting uh, objects were. With a light field microscope, a lenslet array is used in the place of the camera. And then that lenslet array re-images the light onto the camera. And what this allows is for the camera to, to capture an encoded image that says both the uh, position of the light and the direction from whence it came. 
So this sacrifices a little bit of uh, spatial resolution for a dramatic increase in, I guess we could call it the equivalent of the Raleigh range, the depth over which we can image at one time. To be able to convert this light field imaging into uh, what, the, uh, what the image really is, it means we need to capture the light field and then solve the inverse problem. And that gives us a reconstructed volume. That's one of the major limitations in time. And it's also one of the major limitations in performance. Because in conventional wide field illumination light field microscopy, the thing we care about, in this case, the little ovoid you can see, will be illuminated and will emit back. But all the background fluorescence above, below, to the side, and all will also be emitting and also be striking that camera. This is going to decrease the contrast and increase the photo damage because we've got photo bleaching and illumination happening above, below, and to the side of the things we care about. Now light sheet or spin has shown us a way around this and that is by selectively exciting only a single plane and then collecting an image of that single plane to a detector. And so what we've been working on recently, drawing on the idea of SPIM, is the idea of selective volume illumination, using either one or two photon illumination to give us a selective volume and reducing some of the background and some of the phototoxicity. Um, and we win in two ways by this. We win because we get a higher contrast image and we win because we get reduced photo damage. This just shows you uh, a series of images of labeled vasculature in a transgenic zebrafish. And you can see the light sheet image in the upper left. And as the wide field light field microscopy uh, to the lower right, what you can see is as we take a thicker and thicker slab, the resolution uh, of the usable resolution, I guess I should say, and the usable contrast of the image gets worse and worse. But we can see that, that we can, for selective imaging where we care for say in the 100 or 200 micron uh, depth at one time, we can capture single snapshots that get features that are almost obscured in the wide field. So if we try to see this quantitatively, we can see that the image gets progressively lower contrast as we increase the depth all the way up to the wide field. And so the smaller the, the selective volume, the better the resolution. This gives us a chance to really match the problem we're going after with the, with the resolution, with, with the, uh, the problem that we're studying, so the, the thickness of it. This is one of them that is an interesting problem because it involves trying to image the um, labeled bacteria in seawater. So there's not much scattering here, but there's a lot of background from other structures. The wide field illumination, you can't see the individual bacteria. In the raw light field, you can see the bacteria as individual dots, and we can reconstruct and find both where they are and do this on a very rapid uh, thing to see the flows in 3D of these bacteria uh, as they're moving through this cilia-driven flow. If we go back to the heart that we mentioned earlier, here we've got selective plane imaging to the left. We've got uh, selective volume imaging of the developing heart to the right here, or to the middle here. And you can see that we can image both the movement of the myocardium. We can also see the movement of the blood cells. And now the blood cells are actually being captured to where we can reconstruct their trajectories over time. You can see that the, not all of the cells are following uh, the path that others do. You can see that there's two or three of the cells that sort of take a detour and stay for an extra heartbeat within the heart. So we're very excited about the options that we've got for using light 
field together with selective volume imaging as a way of adding to the dimensions, the, in this case, adding to the three dimensionality of the image, but without sacrificing time. So I'm going to stop there and just sort of remind people of what we've talked about today. We've talked a little bit about the multiplex imaging of multiple targets. In this case, I've shown you using um, amplification based on hairpins of uh, initiator tagged antisense probes and antibodies. I showed you the increased performance, both time-wise and, uh, and quality-wise, of going to a phaser approach of analyzing multispectral data. And finally, I've shown you that we can go to three and four and five dimensional imaging, that is multicolor and multidimension, by using two photon light sheet imaging and two photon selective volume imaging. And this is allowing us now to really explore faster imaging and more relevant imaging. I'm going to end by putting up uh, this note to allow me to thank you for the, for the many people that have contributed to this work over the years. The HCR work started when I was at Caltech with Niles Pierce and Harry Choi and his, their colleagues. Um, we moved, when we moved to USC, we extended it and uh, came up with new higher gain versions. And that was mostly the work from Joe and Simon. The hyperspectral phaser has been driven forward by Francesco. And the light sheet and light field imaging has been driven by uh, Tai Truong and his colleagues. And so I'm going to end there. And I hope that, uh, that people have enjoyed hearing about our attempts to add dimensions to imaging, and I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you, Scott. That was an excellent uh, presentation. Um, please um, send in any questions that you have for Scott. Uh, we have some time to um, ask him some of uh, the hard questions. Um, so let me start with one that's here in the, um, in the question section. So what is the success rate of your experiments, uh, meaning the number of exploitable data sets? Um, in my experience, live imaging zebrafish, it's about 10%. Well, so one of the things, thanks for the question, and thank you for <clears throat> being with me virtually. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that we've been working on is making that reliability greater. And so what we've been able to do is to make the imaging quite a bit uh, more accessible and more reliable than that. One of my colleagues in the lab is doing periodic imaging of the same animal in the same region. He goes up to a year of imaging over time, so every one of them needs to work. And so um, while there are many ways for the imaging to goof up, um, it's he's been able and, and the people in the lab in general have been able to exploit uh, our tricks and get uh, recovery rates that are way better than 90%. It's important, we think, because we want something that doesn't just give us one illustrative data set, but we want to be able to follow cells over time in the same animal or over, over time within the same tissue and be able to really understand the dynamics that are going on. So the 10% would mean that we'd always have sort of, you know, a, a, a representative subsampling. And, and so we've been working very hard, giving up a little bit of the highest resolution in some cases to make it robust enough to be above the 90% level. Okay, um, another question. Are, are there concerns for your uh, DL spectra on mixing that any unexpected wavelengths pre present might create good looking but false results? Well, of course, with any uh, image processing uh, uh, tool, the worry is that it could uh, give an optimist 
uh, much better than reality. What we've crafted this for is so that it shows us the residual and shows us unexpected spectra. And it's been very good about warning us that there's something in there that we don't know. And in fact, in that one 3D rendering I showed, I think at the end it showed both autofluorescence and background. Um, and so those were two of the residual channels after all of the expected spectra were dealt with. Um, one of the, I guess one of the concerns could be that uh, some image processing tools can give uh, features that uh, where they're actually introducing structure, introducing colors. And, and we've crafted these so we think that that's very unlikely to happen here. We've had a few cases where um, crosstalk between labels can give us unexpected results. For example, um, the whole uh, principle of uh, primed conversion uh, is, a, is a situation where there's a interaction between the two excitation wavelengths at once to get a, excitations that wouldn't have been expected. Um, so the, uh, what's basically happening is the two lasers that are on at once can excite something that neither one alone might be able to excite, and hence the name primed conversion for doing uncaging, for example. Um, so we uh, typically run test cases to be certain that we are not getting some sort of cross interaction between the light. And we have to do that because often if two different lasers are on at once, we can get an excess uh, photo bleaching effect or pho phototoxicity where the two lasers together both prime some sort of chemistry to take place and then pump that chemistry to take place. Very useful if you want to kill cells, but not so useful if you want to eavesdrop on cells doing things. Um, so uh, the other thing I should mention, by the way, is that in all of these images, we are processing uh, the colors separately from processing the spatial information. So by cleanly separating the two, we're never corrupting or altering the primary data. We're just annotating which label we're calling as contributing to that signal. And so um, we don't have the normal degradation in spatial resolution uh, in order to get the uh, increased uh, chromatic separation that we're uh, able to obtain. So we have time for one more question. Um, and um, this question is, have you considered a FRAT application for protein-protein interactions? And uh, an adjunct to that is, is that possible? Well, so an excellent question. I'm, I'm glad I, uh, I planted it in your mind telepathically. Uh, in fact, FRET is one of the real utilities of these multispectral approaches and in fact, it's even more powerful once we add in lifetime. And what Francesco Cotrale and his colleagues are working on now are tools that allow us to deal with the lifetime of the fluorescence from the dyes, as well as the color of the fluorescence. What that's allowed us to do then is to go after the fret in a way that's much more uh, high fidelity, I guess I should say. Uh, by being able to remove the background, we get a much greater dynamic range. By using the lifetime, we're able to use tools that, that, uh, that the Laboratory for Fluorescence Dynamics at UC Irvine, Enrico Gratton's unit, has been able to define that lets us get a much better handle on what fraction of the molecules are doing FRET, as well as the strength of the FRET, the, potential distance between the two fluorochromes. So um, it, the, the multispectral and multispectral enabled by lifetime imaging, or spectroflam as we like to call it, uh, really gives you some tremendous ability to go after uh, fret indicators and lifetime indicators in ways that we couldn't before. 
anybody that's interested in that should really look at the website that the Laboratory of Fluorescence Dynamics uh, has at UC Irvine because it's just a tremendous resource to be able to use their analytical tools and that sort of analysis. Well, Scott, I think we're going to have to wrap it up there. Um, I thank you for an excellent presentation, very exciting uh, technologies. And um, if you have any other questions, uh, please reach out to Scott and um, send him an email or uh, reach out to him in, uh, through the chat. So can, thanks can again, I just, Scott. Could I just say one thing in response to a couple of the questions that have come in that we're having to cut off? And one of them is how long can we image? And we've imaged for days, long periods. So these techniques are not highly photo bleaching. And so this is something that'd be useful in both organoid settings and in high content settings where you don't want to perturb the, the, um, the tissues at all. So please uh, reach out to me if you have questions and I'd be happy to, um, to answer you one-on-one. -on -one. Thanks again, Scott. Really appreciate it.